Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Urban Ag Hour. Um, we are so excited that you were able to join us this morning and that you will get to hear from some amazing speakers. So the Urban Agriculture Production and Small Scale and Beginning Farmer Program has partnered with USDA, NRCS, and FSA to offer this series. And today we are going to hear from two amazing speakers. Um, we are going to be hearing from Matt Halderson with the Yavapai County Cooperative Extension. He is the County Director for, for Yavapai County. And we will also be hearing from Carly Cork, who is a state representative for NRCS. Um, so we just thank you all that we have this opportunity to hear from both speakers and followed at the end of both of their presentations. We will have a open Q&A at the end for all of you guys to ask any questions. And so now I will hand the spotlight over to Matt um, so he can start and I will let you take it away from here. Let me stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Uh, is everything, is this the, the right screen here? Yes, it is. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Matt Halderson. Uh, I am the the uh, Yavapai County Extension Director up here, but uh, I'm also the Associate Programmatic Agent for Viticulture for the state of Arizona for the U of A. That's because in my last career, uh, which was very recent, I was a uh, a farmer, a viticulturist, a horticulturist professionally. So that's what I did. Uh, so I'm very excited to talk to the folks in Arizona about growing grapes. Uh, primarily, my experience was in wine grapes, but uh, I did manage an acre of table grapes uh, one season and have some experience with juice grapes as well. When we talk about grapes in Arizona, uh, some people look at you sort of funny, especially when you're talking about wine grapes. Uh, a lot of folks think you can't grow wine grapes anywhere but France and California and other places in Europe. But um, but grapes have actually been cultivated and wine been made in Arizona since the 18th century. Some people might have guessed earlier, but uh, there's not actually any documented proof until until the early 1700s that anyone was growing grapes successfully and making wine. Although we do have native Arizona Canyon grapes here. Um, what ended up happening was uh, come, you know, the the wine industry did oh. just fine here in Arizona, except that when prohibition came, it, it hit Arizona quite hard. And actually, Arizona had a prohibition against alcohol before the union ended up taking that over. So that really dampened the Arizona wine industry. And it took a long time for that to come back. But as you can see here, uh, in 20 years, uh, the number of wineries has grown by tenfold. That and, and in 1999, that was 12 wineries, bonded wineries. And in 2019, there's 120 bonded wineries. Um, for most of the mid 20th century, though, Arizona was not known for wine grapes at all. They were known for growing table grapes. And if you look at this article that I found, this article is from 1965. But right there in Maricopa County, where some of you may be uh, stationed at this moment, uh, there were about 4,000 acres of, of wine grapes uh, right there in Maricopa County. I saw a lot of talk about Litchfield Park, which uh, I think is a, um, is a is sort of a, a wealthy subdivision there in, in Arizona. And so that's, that's what's happened to a lot of the table grapes uh, that were grown uh, in the Phoenix River Valley is they got ripped out to build houses. So at one time we had a larger table grape industry than we do have a wine grape industry now, uh, but that has largely gone away. And I think most of the table grape production uh, in Arizona is, uh, is, is, is small ag, is people growing in their backyards, things like that. Wine grape acreage has also doubled uh, since 2012. We're probably hovering somewhere around 2000 acres. So, so still even much smaller than they were in 1965 growing wine grapes. Um, 
because of what Arizona is, we are a place we we do a lot of tourist business, and so it's a great place to to have a thriving wine industry, which is taking over. Now, here's a great example of uh, urban uh, viticulture right here. This is the Caduceus Cellars Hilltop facility that just had their grand opening last month. So this is a working vineyard and winery that is right in the heart of uh, Old Town Cottonwood um, in a really, really nice spot. So if you guys ever get the chance to, to come up to Yavapai County, uh, stop in Cottonwood and, and check out this facility. I would say that the number one reason why grapes are a great product uh, for for Arizona ag, whether that be big or small, is is the is the uh, the water efficiency of of Vitis vinifera, which is the species the grapes come from. Uh, they're extremely water efficient, less than two acre feet per acre of water. If you uh, compare that to pecans, they are five or six acre feet. Uh, when you compare that to cotton, that is four or five acre feet. When you compare to alfalfa, uh, I've heard uh, it depends on where you're growing, but I've heard as much as nine acre feet. Uh, to clarify, an acre foot is about 325,000 gallons of water. So three acre feet is about a million gallons of water per acre. Um, just so we can be on the same page, I wanted to kind of talk about the difference between wine grapes and table grapes. Uh, wine grapes obviously are used to make wine. Table grapes, you know, that's just the term they use uh, for grapes that you would buy in the grocery store and and eat. Uh, people call them dessert grapes, maybe even. Um, not to be confused with juice grapes. Um, most table grapes are not seeded um, for, for consumption. Uh, juice and wine grapes both have seeds. So, uh, by and large, wine grapes are, are generally Vitis vinifera, that is the preferred species to make wine out of, uh, where table grapes are, are primarily vinifera, but they are using some Labrusca and, and Rotundifolia as well. Believe it or not, uh, it, it might be counterintuitive, but wine grapes actually require much higher sugars uh, because you need a certain percentage of, of alcohol, um, and they have much higher acid, which is necessary to balance out that, that sugar. Uh, Juice grapes have a higher tonnage capacity, a higher yield uh, than, or excuse me, not juice grapes, table grapes than you would see with wine grapes, and they also have lower acid. Um, thick skins with wine grapes, a lot of the things that we enjoy about wine are in the skins, not in the pulp. Uh, so the anthocyanins that give it the color, the tannins that give it the mouthfeel, those things are primarily in the skin, so are very important to have. Not so much with, with table grapes. They have large berries, wine grapes, small berries, seeded versus not seeded. Um, wine grapes are known for their low yields. Not, it doesn't have to be that way, but it often is. And table grapes, you're generally looking for higher yields. Uh, the one big thing you have to keep in mind if you are growing uh, table grapes is they are produced for fresh markets, so they have to look really good. Wine grapes don't have to look good at harvest because you end up smashing them into wine. So not nearly as important, but that's something that if you are a producer, you wanna keep in mind. Uh, nice thing about us, for, for us here in Arizona is wine grapes need, by necessity, need a very warm site with full sun. Uh, the Phoenix area, uh, that might that, that is plenty of sun, I would think, but I guess what I'm saying is you don't want them to be shaded all day long. Uh, if you are in a place uh, I know you don't really worry about this in Phoenix so much, but that where there might be frost considerations, you're going to want to plant on a slope somewhere where cold air can drain away. But in Phoenix, maybe you don't have that problem. Uh, Well-draining soils, no matter where you're at. There are root stocks that perhaps you can use uh, for poorly draining soils, um, but in general, it is nice to have a well-draining soil. Riparian areas, while they sound great, are, are a little bit... Uh, sketchy for uh, for grapes because of pest and, and pathogen pressures. Here are some varieties. These are classic varieties if you wanted to grow in your backyard, Thompson Seedless, Cardinal, Perlet. Uh, but keep in mind that some of these varieties, especially wine grapes, will have chilling requirements that you may not be able to meet in Phoenix. So if you are in Phoenix, Tucson, Yuma, these hotter areas, I would stick to, to table grapes generally. Uh, by definition, wine grapes are vines, and so they need something to crawl on, to climb up. They would have done this with trees uh, in their natural environment, but we tend to build trellises for them. Uh, you can use a fence. 
that works just as well if you are growing at your home. Here are some different styles. This is the uh, vertical shoot positioning style of trellis, uh, a Geneva double curtain, a liar trellis system. Uh, they can be trained as fans, right? This is many, many trunks growing up as a fan. This is called cordon training, where you just train on one wire. And then this would be head training, where things just stand on their own and are just at the top of a head. Canopy management is, is crucial. If you, especially if you want to stay away from pesticides, you need to have good canopy management. Uh, we prune these vines meticulously uh, to form their structure as well as keep them open and to set the amount of crop that we want. This is head trained and uh, cane pruned here where they just leave one new cane on each side. Uh, this is cordon trained and spur pruned where you have a spur about every six inches. Uh, you start getting into shoot thinning and leaf removal. These are to open the can. These are concepts to open the canopy up. If you can open your canopy up properly, uh, then you will have less, much less pressure from molds and mildews and insects that like to hide inside your canopy. They like high relative humidity. Uh, they like cooler temperatures, so they don't like direct heat. Uh, in Phoenix, you know, it gets above 95 pretty fast there. You guys, it probably is above 95 today. So that will kick back a lot of your pathogen pressure, luckily. Uh, you'll also want to remove suckers. Those are going to be uh, vines that are or canes that are growing up from the bottom there. And if your, cane, if your um, fields start getting too big, people will do what they call summer pruning and, or hedging. As far as irrigation goes, it's something because we, we don't use too much water, but it's a strategy that we like to use called deficit irrigation, which is after fruit set, we start to pull the water back just a little bit so we can get the vine to stop growing and actually focus its energy no longer on growing shoots, on growing vegetative material, but on growing the fruit, right? So we can ripen up as much fruit as possible. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, well, do I need to buy some kind of a soil moisture sensor or something like that? Uh, no, not necessary at all. Uh, I spent a lot of time farming without any technology like that at all. You can look at vines and you can really tell what level of stress they are under when you are pulling the water back. The first thing you'll see is uh, the tendrils, uh, which are classic for these vines, what they use to hold on to trellis wire or trees or, or whatever we're talking about, they start to go limp and they will be limp in the morning, right? You have to check in the morning because uh, you know things are always hot in the afternoon, but much cooler in the morning. You will start seeing these shoot tips, the internode lengths start to get shorter and shorter. And that just means as each new, uh, each new node is, is forming, uh, the length of inner node that it produced before that is much shorter, so your vines are slowing down. Tendrils start to desiccate the more stress you put them under. Eventually, shoot tips will burn off, and if you start seeing yellow basil leaves, you've probably gone too far. So all of these, these first three especially, are, are just fine. Burnt ship tips are not a problem, but if you start losing leaves, you are administering too much stress for these vines. I wanna to touch briefly on the pests that we might see. We don't have enough time to go into too much of that, uh, but I really wanna focus on the fact that we should be using, especially if you are trying to minimize the use of pesticides to focus on integrated pest and disease management, right? So being able to properly identify those pests uh, we were just working with a, a tomato grower, funny enough, he thought that he had thrips for the longest time and he was spraying insecticide after insecticide with, with no benefit. Uh, he took it to us and we found out that he actually had mites. So uh, it's crucial that you identify these pests properly and really understand the biology of these pests. Uh, this is a, a grape leaf skeletonizer, which you may see in your vines from time to time. Uh, you can use Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, which is a, a biological uh, that must be ingested by these caterpillars to work. Uh, it will have no effect on the adult moths. So you need to really understand the biology of these creatures before you try and control them. Monitoring is crucial. Uh, you need to monitor to know what's out in your field, and you also need to monitor after any sorts of treatments that you make to understand whether these, these treatments worked or not. 
Um, understanding action thresholds is just a fancy way to say, do we really need a spray yet? Do we really need to treat yet? Is there anything, you know, uh, an action threshold is the point where I must take action uh, before I start suffering economic losses. Right? Everything is on a system level, right? So again, if you are understanding site selection, things like that, before you plant down by a riparian area, by the creek, although it's very romantic, uh, that will bring on uh, a large population of pests and pathogens and and things like that will that will make your life harder. How much you irrigate, uh, how much fertilizer you put on, all these things work together, right? And then, of course, cultural practices that I talked about earlier, opening up your canopy, shoot thinning, removing leaves, things like that. And then to make sure that you are pushing against pesticide resistance using multiple strategies at the same time is always helpful. Uh, you know, I do have some experience. I think a lot of you will be interested in growing table grapes. Uh, you know, if you have a small operation, maybe you're selling at a farmer's market. That's what we did. We had an acre of table grapes. Um, we really didn't manage them any different than our wine grapes, other than the fact that they have to be visually pleasing, right? So uh, we would harvest clusters as they looked perfect, right? So they had to be uniformly colored. Uh, and then we would actually spend time thinning out any undesirable berries or anything that, that wouldn't look good for the market, right? So that's, that's the biggest difference between wine grapes and table grapes that you need to keep in mind. Other practices that some people use, especially you would see this in California and you used to see this in Arizona, was people used to girdle the vines, right? Uh, 10 days after bloom, they would girdle these vines. And what you would see, you would see uh, bigger berries, because that's always really desirable with table grapes and improved fruit set. Uh, gibberellic acid is a naturally occurring plant hormone that was also used, it's sprayed to elongate clusters, right, to reduce the compactness of clusters. Um, they did that because once you have very compact clusters, it becomes a lot easier for pests and pathogens uh, to get a hold in there berries would actually break themselves as they expanded. And that's when, when diseases would, would impact your fruit. Uh, one thing to keep in mind though, is gibberellic acid can also impact the fruitfulness of, of future vintages. Um, so those are things that, that you definitely wanna keep in mind going forward. As I said, I grew table grapes. We grew them just like our wine grapes, no girdling. Uh, we tried gibberellic acid once, it really didn't have the effect that we want, but I think that you can grow them very similarly. I'm just about out of time, um, but I wanted to talk with you very quickly. Uh, if you are interested in just some growing, maybe a small vineyard at home to make some wine, here's some quick math, uh, some quick numbers that you should understand uh, so that you can, you know, one grapevine is not going to make a lot of wine and it's not even worth uh, trying to make a bottle of wine, right? We usually grow, uh, make wine by the carboy, which is five gallons, or by the barrel, which is 59 gallons. So if you think that one vine will create about eight to 10, uh, eight to 12 pounds of fruit, and we just call it 10 pounds of fruit each, uh, we know that one ton gives you about 130, maybe uh, 180, we'll say 150 on average gallons of wine. Uh, that means if you want to get five gallons of wine plus some topping wine, you'll need a little extra wine there. Uh, so six gallons of wine, you need about eight to 10 vines. So consider that that's how much space you will need uh, to create the amount of wine uh, that you want. If you are going to go really big, if you want to create an entire barrel of wine, which is 59 gallons of wine, uh, plus maybe another carboy full for, for topping wine to top that off, you'll need about 90 plants. Uh, those plants tend to be spaced about six feet apart uh, in each direction. You probably at your home, you can get away with a little bit tighter uh, spacing. Um, you'll need a, almost a tenth of an acre, right? Maybe you can get away with tighter spacing than that at home, but on kind of a, from my commercial numbers that I understand, six feet is about as, as tight as you would want those plants to be. 
so that was my my quick presentation. Uh, I am open for questions afterwards. It sounds like we are going to hold questions until afterwards. Uh, please take my email down if you are interested in growing grapes at your home or uh, even on an urban ag uh, scale. Please contact me. Uh, Cooperative Extension is a free resource, right? I not only work in Yavapai County, but I uh, work with wine growers, grape growers, I should say, uh, throughout the entire state. So I am certainly available if you have uh, more questions or concerns or are interested in, in setting up a vineyard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, that was a great presentation. I am now going to turn it over to Carly, and we will answer any questions that we have for Matt at the end. Um, so just keep those questions coming. And now, Carly, I will hand it over to you. Doki, um, is everybody seeing the right thing? <laughs> I um, don't see a presentation. Uh-oh. Come on now. Not yet. <laughs> oh, there we go. I see it now. All right. Okay, cool. All right. So, um, <clears throat> hi, everybody. Uh, like uh, we mentioned, I'm Carly Cork. I am the, the state wildlife biologist for NRCS Arizona. Um, I've been officially with the agency for about two years now. Um, and, uh, when I started with NRCS, I didn't even know how to spell NRCS. So I'm going to go in, uh, to NRCS a little bit and what we can do with, uh, pollinators. Um, so, uh, NRCS is the Natural Resources Conservation Service. We're a government agency, um, part of the Department of Agriculture. We provide technical and financial assistance to ag producers, um, who, oops, <laughs> who want to uh, implement conservation activities on their operation. Um, <clears throat> this agency was established after the Dust Bowl, um, and we were focused on soil health, but um, as we were learning that uh, farming and ag producing really takes the whole ecosystem to support it, um, we decided we needed a more holistic approach, and we changed the name to the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, we're still considered the expert agency on soils. Uh, we employ a variety of, of different um, different uh, focuses, like soil scientists, botanists, rangeland specialists, um, <clears throat> agronomists, biologists. Um, so NRCS recently, um, we've been working with large scale agricultural producers for a long time, and we recently have expanded to start um, servicing uh, urban and small agriculture. Um, so just a couple of um, common NRCS definitions that I'm probably going to throw out during this this uh, presentation are a conservation plan, which is um, the baseline information about the landscape, uh, identified resource concerns, which is also an NRCS jargon, um, and conservation practices uh, that can uh, address those resource concerns. So a, res a resource concern is what you might expect. Um, uh, some sort of degradation of the soil, water, air, plant, or animal resource, and a conservation practice or activity is any action that you take to rectify that. Okay, so with that background on NRCS, we're going to go into pollinators. So who are pollinators? Um, <clears throat> pollinators is a term for a group of animals that crosses several taxa. Uh, a pollinator can be an insect like those we typically think of like bees and butterflies, also mosquitoes, beetles, wasps. Um, there are mammal pollinators, uh, bats and mice. Um, anything that can get small enough or anything that's small enough to get into a flower is essentially a pollinator. Um, bats are an extremely important pollinator in this state, especially in regards to saguaro um, and other cactus who uh, bloom at night. And of course, bird species are are pollinators such as the hummingbird pictured here. Um, <clears throat> pollen and nectar have a really high sugar content and they tend to be really high value forage for many species. Um, a lot of uh, mammals like large mammals will eat flowers just because they have a lot of that energy in them and the pollen uh, gets on them and it's spread that way. 
So <clears throat> one of the reasons why as an agriculture producer, you should care um, is the benefit of pollinators to agriculture. Pollinators increase the nation's crop values by 18 to $27 billion each year without pollinator species. It's thought that 70% of plants would be unable to reproduce or provide food. Um, <clears throat> Of the 100 crop varieties that provide 90% of the world's food, uh, 71 are pollinated by bees. In North America, bees alone pollinate nearly 95 different kinds of fruits, almonds, avocados, cranberries, apples, um, in addition to things like soy and corn. It's thought that one out of every three mouthfuls of food we consume in the US was produced with assistance from pollinators, um, including meat, uh, from the alfalfa that feeds the livestock and grains, fruits, vegetables, um, all sorts of different things. Pollinators are also incredibly important to natural ecosystems. Uh, in addition to the obvious, you know, pollinating wildflowers, allowing them to spread and reproduce, um, some plants need to reproduce via pollinators. Um, some can reproduce uh, via wind, but, but a lot of them need pollinators. Um, <clears throat> Invertebrate species in general are an important food source for other species. 85% of animal biomass in the world is insects, and um, there are a lot of species that take advantage of this extremely high protein content. 89% um, of bird species rely on invertebrates for at least one stage in their life, typically when they're immature and they require that really high protein content. Um, they're also, insects are also eating other insects. Um, spiders eat more biomass of insects every year than there is biomass of mammals on the planet. So without other insects, we would have a lot more insects. Um, unfortunately, insects are in a global decline. Um, they're facing the typical things that a lot of animals are facing, climate change, habitat loss, uh, pesticide pressure. Insects especially are seeing a decline across the globe. 28% uh, of bumblebee species are threatened with extinction and 71% of North American butterflies are. Um, especially interesting here in the West is the Western monarch, which reside, breed, and overwinter in Arizona. Um, since 1980, there's been a 95% decrease in Western monarch numbers, and since the 90s, there has been another like 80% decrease in that leftover population, so we're really down a lot of monarchs. <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, uh, there are more pollinator species out there than are than just bees. Arizona has some really amazing insect species that are also pollinators, such as hoverflies, wasps, um, like this tarantula hawk pictured here. It is uh, foraging on some nectar. Um, even though they're not primarily uh, pollinators and they primarily are, are parasitoid, um, they still use these nectar resources and can still be really important pollinators. Um, so I could really make a huge presentation about every type of pollinator out there, but um, I'm going to focus down on bees a little bit. Um, they have a really wide range of habitat requirements, so they're a good umbrella species. They are the most efficient pollinators, um, natural pollinators, and um, it's really easy to impact them on uh, agricultural operations. So um, bees are considered the best pollinators because they're eating the pollen. So unlike other pollinator species um, who are eating the nectar, they, and just accidentally collecting uh, the pollen, bees are collecting the pollen itself. Um, so it does get stuck to them. Um, you can see this bee has a, what's called pollen pants. <laughs> you can see the little glob of pollen stuck to its leg, um, but they're, they are foraging for that pollen. Additionally, um, bees, native bees, uh, will learn flowers and have a preference for a specific species, um, which uh, co-evolved with the plants as they would like to be, uh, they would like their pollen to be uh, deposited on another of the same species. Um, <clears throat> so bees that are local to your area will learn your flowers and where they are and what's what. Um, there are some plants in Arizona that can only be buzz pollinated by bees. Uh, that's not super common, but it does happen in, uh, it 
they get really impacted by the lack of bees. Um, we're really special here in Arizona because um, we have the highest biodiversity of bee species in the United States. Um, we have a thousand over uh, out of the 3,600 native species here. And uh, so when you're talking about a thousand species, it's very useful to separate them down into groups. So um, <clears throat> the first two groups make up most of the native bees. Um, which are solitary bees, the ground nesting bees and the tunnel nesting bees, solitary bees. Uh, and then there are bumblebees who are social. Um, typically bumblebees are, uh, we think about the European hum honeybee, which I consider to be a livestock species. Um, they do hybridize with native bees, uh, but these native bees are much more well adapted to the native vegetation that we have here. So. Um, they are, are better able to pollinate, they can buzz pollinate better, uh, they carry more pollen, et cetera. So uh, <clears throat> about 70% of the bee species we have here are ground nesting bees. Uh, they'll build their nests in holes in the ground, such as this one right here. Um, and at the beginning of the season, the adults emerge and start foraging and searching for mates. Once they're mated, they dig the hole in the ground, um, they prefer sandy to loamy soils without disturbance. But obviously, you don't want to get your babies dug up. And once they make the hole, they put their egg inside with a pollen ball, and then they will seal it for the rest of the, the season. They'll seal it off with dirt and other substrates, and they'll lay as many eggs as they can. And then the, the baby bee will mature in there. It'll eat the uh, pollen ball, pupate, and then the next season, it'll start all over again. Um, so these types of bees are very sensitive to tillage practices and disturbed ground, as you might uh, might have guessed. About 30% of Arizona bees are tunnel nesting species. Um, they are going to clear out this pithy part of the stem. Uh, this is a rose bush, and they'll use it almost the same way that ground nesting bees use theirs. So they will make a little tunnel, they will uh, lay the egg inside, place a pollen ball inside, um, and then when the when the pupae uh, gets old enough, it will start eating it, and then it will, you know, just leave the, the tunnel as it goes. And they'll stack several babies um, in a line. They can really be efficient and put a bunch of little bees in there. Uh, this this image shows bees in uh, various stages of maturity uh, because they were laid at different times. Carpenter bees are very common tunnel nesters in Arizona. They eat pollen and eat wood and they use sawdust or wood pulp to seal off their young. Um, this is a female carpenter bee. Uh, you can tell because it's big and it's black and it will make a loud uh, drone-like buzzing sound when it flies around. Um, the males are bright yellow. Mason bees are another species of tunnel nesters. They use mud or clay to seal out their young rather than uh, sawdust. Leafcutter bees are another species of tunnel nesting bees. Um, they're this cute fuzzy little gray bees and they use leaf pulp to seal off their young. So you can tell when you have uh, leafcutter bees in your area because they will take these circular cuts out of leaves um, <clears throat> to use them to, uh, to seal off their young. Bumblebees. <clears throat> So there are about 57 species of bumblebees in the US. Um, they live in a colony, they have a queen. Uh, the life cycle starts with a mated queen. She'll uh, usually find a hole that's made by other animals and then she'll start producing workers. The workers collect pollen and stir honey. And at the end of the season, the queen starts producing male bees and queens. Mated queens then overwinter in litter and duff until spring when it begins again. So if you're in an area where uh, you experience frost, um, you really need that that litter and duff resource for them to overwinter in. Um, and it needs to be left on the ground all winter so that they can senesce during that time. Okay, so now that we understand a little bit more about the ecology of our important pollinators, um, let's start talking about what we can do to improve the habitat. So like every animal, they need things like food, shelter, and protection. Um, 
I didn't say water because most of our native bees derive all the water they need from the nectar they drink. But uh, honeybees really require a lot of clean water. Honey is a, a really hard resource to make, um, very water protect, uh, very water intensive um, to create that honey. So honey producing bees do need water resources. Uh, typically most of our native bees, not so much. So uh, the key to creating quality habitat for pollinators is to have diverse and persistent pollen and nectar source. So the perfect pollinator garden has a variety of flowering plant plants that are different shapes, different sizes, different colors. They bloom at different times. So ideally you would want a rainbow blooming all year long. Um, we live in the real world. Um, so we're just gonna try to do the the best we can. And if we're going to sacrifice something, we're going to just try to make sure that uh, there is there are blooming flowers all year long. Um, in some of the colder parts of the state, we can't have blooming plants in the winter, but in a lot of, uh, you know, Phoenix and Tucson areas, um, you can have blooming plants all year. Um, uh, <clears throat> anyone who has any sort of allergies can attest to that we can have a, a lot of pol pollen all year long. Um, so for some plants that we're thinking about planting, we might need to think about the sex of the plant. Not all uh, male and female plants both produce flowers. Um, sometimes only the males flower, sometimes only the females flower. So um, when you're really thinking about uh, acreage constraints, you really need to plan what species you're planting and then additionally look and see if there's a, a sex consideration you should think of as well. So um, like I said, insects need shelter. Uh, most bee species in Arizona are ground nesters and they're a very, very important part of the reproductive cycle. Like I said, they're very vulnerable to tillage practices. Um, when creating habitat for pollinators, it's really important to think about having bare untilled ground near where you want these pollinators to pollinate. So if you want them to pollinate a field, make sure you have some sort of refugia of bare untilled ground um, that they can, they can put their nests in. Um, like I said before, in some parts of the state, you might need to make sure that you have the, the litter resources around so that they can overwinter. Um, insects are ectothermic. They cannot generate their own body heat. Um, they pretty much go to sleep all winter underneath that duff. So it also needs to be uh, undisturbed. <clears throat> so... Um, one of the things NRCS can help with is uh, tillage practices. So NRCS supports producers doing low and no tillage practices, as well as residue management and uh, different uh, pesticide uh, plans. <clears throat> so when you, if you, uh, if you cooperate with NRCS, we will uh, create some sort of uh, plan that works for you. Uh, depending on what your goals are. Um, <clears throat> but as you might uh, have guessed, uh, really important for insect pollinators is to protect them from pesticides. Uh, both insecticides and herbicides can have an effect on pollinators. Uh, the use of targeted pesticides can reduce the impact to pollinators um, as long as you follow the label on the bottle. Um, a lot of pesticides have information on the label that's targeted to protect honeybees. Um, like for instance, if a pesticide label says to spray after to spray after sunset, they're likely trying to reduce harm to honeybees that will be out and about, um, you know, more during the day. But it might be it, it would be beneficial to uh, observe your field and see what kind of uh, pollinators you have, because maybe you have a lot of nocturnal moths or butterflies that you might want to protect. Uh, you might want to not spray after sunset. There might be a different time that's better. Um, if you see pollinators foraging out on your uh, crop field, you can take note of what time they're out there um, so that you can avoid uh, herbicides or pesticides uh, while they're out and about foraging. Um, another important pesticide is the, uh, the seed inoculated pesticides are very harmful to insects. 
A great way to protect areas for pollinators is hedgerows. Uh, this is a photo of an NRCS hedgerow in California. Um, they can be multifunctional, they're beautiful, um, they can prevent noise and dust, and uh, they can provide nectar resources. So you can see that this hedge is very diverse, it has a lot of different colored flowering plants. Um, <clears throat> they can also be pro uh, installed to uh, intercept and catch pesticide drift. Um, uh, a pesticide catching hedgerow would have different considerations. Um, for instance, you might not want to put a bunch of uh, pollinator friendly plants next to, you know, in a hedgerow where you're catching pesticide uh, drift, but um, evergreens and uh, a lot of really leafy plants are very good at uh, draw, uh, stopping pesticide drift. Just real quick, um, we've talked a lot about bees. Um, but uh, those considerations for bees will benefit a wide range of pollinators. Um, but it is important to remember that certain butterfly species require certain host plants. Uh, blanket flower is a host for sulfur butterflies. And of course, the most famous, I think the one that most people know is um, milkweeds support monarchs. Um, there are a couple of different, or 29 species of milkweed in Arizona. Um, that are native, so you just got to pick the one that falls in your uh, in your in your planting zone. And that is it. We'll save questions for the end. Uh, there's my contact information if anybody wants to contact me. And that's it. Thank you so much, Carly. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. I will put up our um, survey for all of our participants to go on and hopefully take. And now we will get started into our questions. So you guys are more than welcome to send them in the chat. Um, you can unmute yourself and ask those questions as well. Um, so yeah. We'll go into our Q&A time. One question that I got from the chat was for Carly and it says, what pollination requirements, oh, I guess it's for Carly and Matt maybe, <laughs> sorry. Um, what pollination requirements do wine grapes have and how can we support that in both a small scale and or urban environment? Great question. Uh, they, they are self-pollinated, so you they do not require uh, pollinators from outside. Um, it is still often because there are alleyways or plants around that if we are applying any kind of pesticides, we do usually spray at night uh, to avoid dinging any pollinators, but um, but yeah, they are not like apples and pecans and other things that require pollinators to be brought in. But there, there is room for uh, pollinator plantings in the rows, and they're quite beautiful if you're interested in such a thing. Yeah, you certainly can. I mean, I, I, I think that in a lot of these. Uh, adults that require pollen, their larvae can be beneficial insects, right? So it's it's great to support pollinators uh, where you can. Absolutely. Perfect. Another question I got from the chat was for building a pollinator habitat at a new farm in the low desert, do you recommend a combination of native and desert adapted perennial plants? Um, and do you have any plant lists to share? Yeah, we have plant lists. Um, I'm not sure how to how to get them out to people, but um, we have pollinator plant lists. Um, uh, we have a plant material center in Tucson. Uh, they have come out with several public publications about um, pollinator plants in Arizona. Um, I do recommend uh, desert adaptive native 
adapted native plants. Um, like I mentioned, our native bees are keyed into the native plants, so they really do provide a lot more uh, nectar resources if they're native versus uh, non-native plants. Perfect. And then what type of low water trees slash plants are best for hedgerows um, in addition to wine grapes, I'm assuming? So uh, it depends on, on what you're using the hedgerow for specifically, um, but I typically, typically think of um, evergreens, um, it if you're using it to block herbicide uh, or pesticide drift, um, really leafy like uh, junipers and and pine tree things work really well for catching that drift. Um, and uh, I think that that the that grasses are often left out of hedgerows, but they can native grasses are really important for those hedgerows too um, for uh, the pollinators. I might also add that if you're spraying and the wind is over 10 miles an hour, you are, that is a bad idea in the first place. So make sure you are spraying in a low wind scenario between three and 10 miles an hour. Does anybody else have any more questions for our two amazing speakers? Oh, here's another one. Um, it says, what is a good summer cover crop mix to use for pollinators and can best be used for a forage crop? That is a good question that I don't really know the answer to. Um, allowing um, some crops to bolt, just not a... Not, uh, not harvesting them and just letting them bolt is a good, easy way of um, incorporating pollinator habitat into your operation. But um, we probably have lists for <laughs> cover crop mix somewhere. Yeah, another thing then... that I saw is we, we planted a, a grass cover crop and we didn't mow it. It was a very low growing grass. But what you saw by not cultivating in between the vines not mowing is native plants just started to come in, right? So I would say whatever, what is a great pollinator? My guess would be look around and see what grows native in the desert or uh, wherever you live. Perfect. In addition to the last question I just read, um, it says, and can they be interceded into a grape patch? Yeah, absolutely. Ab cover crops are super important uh, to support beneficials. To hold your soil in place is really important to, to, to keep your soil from eroding, especially um, when we have these torrential monsoon rains uh, to keep your whole vineyard from not washing away. Um, and also, we talked a lot about, well, a lot. Well, I, I mentioned briefly about using uh, irrigation to control the size of your vines. Uh, it is helpful if you've got a cover crop during the monsoons to soak up some of that water uh, because you can control irrigation. You cannot control rainwater. Sam, what is the demand and supply of wine um, and table grapes in Arizona like? Are there any pressures on the price or barriers to establishing a new mm -hmm. vineyard? Uh, it's very expensive to establish a vineyard of any size, uh, for sure. I, I think the one of the biggest challenges about table grapes is you need packing houses and sort of a market, whereas with, with a winery, you can have your own winery uh, and, and build out from there. Um, but of course, if you, can, if you can get into a farmer's market type of scenario, you will need some kind of cold storage potentially if if you are selling table grapes of any size though. Um, does anyone else have any more questions?
I will um, let people kind of think about any questions that they may have for a little while. Um, for all of our participants, I put the QR code and the link um, on the screen for anyone to take a quick survey. That will just help us to um, kind of figure out what everybody is looking for from our future events. And then um, someone, a few people are asking about like links for plant lists. I put a link uh, for a plant list in the chat. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And I guess I'll add, if you're in Yavapai County, um, Cooperative Extension, Yavapai County Cooperative Extension does have a native and naturalized uh, plant database. Uh, but it will, and some of those might cross over because we go all the way down to Black Canyon City and, you know, all the way up to Sedona. So if you're in other counties and over to Gila, but um, it's focused primarily on plants from, from Yavapai County. Those are some awesome resources. Thank you so much, guys. Well, let's see. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who attended this month's Urban Ag Hour. Um, we just hope that you guys really appreciated it. Um, for don't forget to fill out the quick survey that's on the um screen, and then I do have another question. Um, so it says, would drip or flood irrigation be best for grapes? Absolutely drip, no doubt about it. Um, grapes just don't need that much water uh, and precise irrigation is generally pretty important uh, for, for irrigation of grapes. So uh, I would definitely, I mean, you can do flood irrigation, we can flood irrigate anything, but um, but I would definitely recommend drip irrigation. It's much more efficient, less water use. All right, well, if nobody has any more questions, this will conclude this month's Urban Ag Hour. Um, we thank you so much for all attending and we really appreciate our two speakers that came and gave some great knowledge to everyone. Um, and we hope to see you guys next month on November 15th. Thank you so much, everyone.